On Sunday and Wednesday nights, we've been going back through the seven basic purposes of the church. And those seven basic purposes are, again, worship, prayer, devotion to God's Word, being led by the Holy Spirit, doing ministry, having fellowship and building one another up, and spreading the gospel. You may be wondering, is he going to show this slide every single time? And the answer is yes, I am. This is important information. It's uh, what we've based our mission statement on, and so it's good to see it again and again. We're just doing it for a brief little while. Uh, The past two Wednesdays, we've had a business meeting, so we've mostly been reviewing these on Sunday nights, but tonight we're talking specifically about the fourth purpose, being led by the Holy Spirit. And we've talked about how as a church we need to be led by the Spirit. After all, this whole series and the point of what we're talking about are the seven basic purposes of the church. But we need to come to realize that when we talk about the church, we're not talking about an organization or a building where people meet. We're not talking about the incorporated organization known as First Baptist Church Central City. We're talking about the collection of believers that meets together here. We're talking about you and me. And so in order for our church to be led by the Spirit, in order for us as a body to know God's will and to do it, then we as individuals must also be led by the Spirit every day. We must walk by the Spirit and do what the Spirit would have us to do so that we can live lives that please God. So tonight we're looking at what it means to walk by the Spirit in our individual lives and how that translates into the life of our church. And what I want you to see tonight is that without each of us walking by the Spirit every day, there's no way that our church can be led by the Spirit. So we look now to Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 17. And before we read, let us pray together. Almighty God, we thank you again for this time that we have. God, we thank you once more for the opportunity and the privilege to open your word and to be spoken to through your word. And God, we do pray that you would speak to us tonight. God, we pray that you would work in our hearts this evening and make us more like your son, Jesus. God, we pray that you would help us to receive your word and to be transformed by it and made more and more into the sanctified new creation that you desire to make us into. Lord, we thank you that you have had a plan for our lives before we were born, and we just pray that you would help us to be obedient to you and obedient to what you would have us to do. God, we pray that you would help us to walk by the Spirit, and we pray that through this time together, you would just convict us and draw us to yourself again. And we will give you the praise and the glory for all that you accomplish in our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Romans chapter 8, beginning of verse 1. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have. And in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement of the law would be fully satisfied for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. Before we continue there, Paul writes that there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Earlier in chapter 5, he wrote about how we are all under the condemnation of God through the sin that came into the world through Adam. In Adam, we were all condemned And in that condemnation, death spread to everyone because sin spread to everyone. Sin was like a contagion and Adam was patient zero. But now we see that in Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation because by belonging to Jesus, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed us from the power of sin that leads to death. When Paris was liberated in 1944, toward the end of World War II, the Allies declared France free 
Even though a large portion of France was still under Nazi control, when Germany lost control of the capital, the Nazi power base was broken. And it was only a matter of time before the remaining forces were driven out of the country. Well, in the same way, the cross of Jesus Christ has broken the power and the claim of evil over the lives of believers. We may still struggle with sin and we may still find ourselves living with the effects of sin, but nevertheless, sin's power is defeated by what Jesus accomplished. And it's only a matter of time before the lingering effects of sin are driven out of our world completely. Verse 5. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Now, it's easy for us, if we're not careful, to read verses 5 through 8 as if Paul's talking about our spiritual lives in almost a schizophrenic way. Okay, but the point that's being made here is not that we sometimes live under the control of our sinful nature and sometimes we let the Spirit control our minds, but rather Paul sets up a distinct difference between those who are enslaved to sin and those who are controlled by the Spirit. You can't be a little bit of both. This is an either-or condition. A person is either completely under the power of sin or they are controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, that is not at all to say that following the Spirit we do not sin. And again, we go back to the illustration about France in 1944. The point is simply that verses 5 through 8 are talking about two very different, very opposite ways of existing. Under the control of sin or by the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 9. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. And Christ lives within you. So even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. God's Spirit is so powerful and so life-giving that even though our bodies will indeed face death because of sin, because the spirit of Jesus dwells within those who have put their faith in Jesus, God will raise our bodies up from the dead just as God raised Jesus up from the dead. And having been dead, God will give life to our bodies by the power of his Holy Spirit. Verse 12. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. Now, I wanted to make it clear when we read verses 5 through 8 that we should never think that we can live both controlled by sin and controlled by the Spirit. If Jesus Christ has truly saved us, then sin has no power over us. That crucial point being made, we are indeed still at war with our sinful nature. The scripture makes it clear here. As those living in the power of the Holy Spirit, verse 12, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. We still war with our sinful nature and we still see its lingering effects. But even though we may still be tempted, and even though we may still fall to temptation from time to time, we can't say that we are slaves to sin any longer. Any longer. 
In Jesus Christ, we have been freed from the power of sin by his Holy Spirit. If you believe that you are enslaved to sin, if you believe that you're living in bondage to sin, then you either don't understand the nature of your salvation in Christ or you haven't been saved. And that's a question that you have to answer by examining yourself biblically. That's a question that you have to look at. But the scripture is clear. We are freed from sin by the Spirit. As Christians redeemed by the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, we are empowered to war against sin and to overcome it through the Spirit of Jesus. Again, Paul writes, if you live by the dictates of the sinful nature, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live. Our battle with sin, in other words, isn't won in a momentary decision. But rather, it's a lifetime commitment to following Jesus. In another passage of Scripture, Paul said, I crucify my flesh daily. In the same way, we must rise up daily to follow Jesus. Trusting in his Holy Spirit and taking refuge in his Holy Spirit so that we might live lives that please God. Verse 14. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's Spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his Spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. We come to the conclusion of our passage and find that all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So the flow of the argument so far goes like this. All human beings stand condemned. But there is no condemnation for those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. Those who trust in Jesus are given his Holy Spirit and thus they walk by the Spirit. They follow Jesus at the leading of his Spirit. And these who live by the Spirit, living a life that pleases God, are the true children of God. Therefore, we no longer live as fearful slaves of the harsh master of sin. But rather, the Bible tells us we have been adopted into the same family of which Jesus Christ is a part. Because we have received the spirit of Jesus and have Christ's spirit living in us, we have become adopted children of God and thus now we call God Abba, Father. In other words, we're on a personal, intimate, first name basis with God. We can come boldly before the Lord with all confidence as a child would come to a gracious unconditionally loving father and because we are his children through what Jesus has done for us we are heirs of God's glory Amen. we share in the glory of Jesus so how does this translate into church life well, as a church, we are the ones who are called to be the light of the world. Our lives as children of God, led by his Holy Spirit, are supposed to look radically different than the lives of those who are under the domination of sin. So if all of us are simply living in the same way that the world lives either because we simply have stopped battling with the flesh or because we fooled ourselves into thinking we're Christians when we never actually received the Spirit. If all of us are simply living in the same way the world is, then we're not going to be able to follow Christ. We're not going to be able to show the world a different way of living. We're not going to be able to deny ourselves of our own power and follow Jesus. Jesus. 
We're not going to be able to choose Jesus' plans for our church and for our lives over our preferences. We're not going to be able to get past the mentality of being served so that we can get to the mentality like Jesus had of serving others. If we aren't being led by the Spirit, if we don't have the Spirit of Jesus Christ residing in our hearts, then our church as a body will not be able to accomplish anything for God's kingdom. Essentially, we'll become like a club, a country club even, without the golfing, so to speak. We won't actually do anything. We'll just have a vague concept of membership. But if we're a church that's constituted by people who have the Holy Spirit residing in our hearts and who choose every day to follow Jesus by following the leading of his Spirit, then we will be a church that is on mission, that doesn't stagnate, that doesn't grow stale, and that doesn't fight over preferences or egos or disagreements. The world, Central City, our community, the whole world desperately needs the church because the world desperately needs Jesus. And if we're going to be the church and give people Jesus, then we are going to have to die to self so that the crucified and risen Savior can make us into the new creation that he has created us and redeemed us to be through his Spirit. As those who have received the salvation of God in Jesus Christ, not because of anything we've done, not because we're good people, because we put in the time, but as those who have looked to the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, and faithfully and humbly put our trust in Him. He gives us His Spirit. And He enables us to follow Him. We need to make the choice every day to follow His leading, to do His will for His kingdom, and to reach lost people who do not know Him and desperately need him. Pray with me. God, we pray that you would help us as your church not to fade into the scenery of the world, not to just kind of go off into obscurity, just to go off into the background. But God, help us to go out to our community, to our nation, to our world, and to show them what you have done through your son, Jesus Christ. Help us to go out with our lives and show people who it is that you want to make them into to show people the redemption that you offer, the, the freedom from sin, the true life that you offer through your son Jesus. Not because we're anybody, not because we want people to be like us, but because we are the people who have received your grace. Lord, we are the people who should be following your Holy Spirit, following your leading. Lord, we pray that you would help our church to be led by your Spirit. Lord, help us not to just do things because we've always done them or to do things because it sounds like a great idea. God, help us to listen to what you would have us to do and to walk by the Spirit. But Lord, in our individual lives and hearts, we pray that you would forgive us and make us aware when we start to do things on our own. Lord, when we just kind of get into the flow of things, when we just kind of go through the motions day by day, help us instead, Lord, to humble ourselves before you and to be led where you would have us to go. God, we pray that you would be with us now, Lord, that you would speak to each of us, speak to us as a church. Use us for your glory and for the upbuilding of your kingdom. And it's in Christ's name that we pray.
Amen.